Thank you. I'm Michael Robertson, the president of the William Morris Society in the United States. Um, I got to know today's speaker, Sarah Mead Leonard, a few years ago when I had the honor of serving on the committee that awards the Joseph Dunlap Memorial Fellowship for an outstanding research project on William Morris. Um, the, uh, Sarah received that award for her uh, PhD dissertation in art history at the University of Delaware um, for a work titled The Beauty of the Bao Hung Banks, William Morris in the Thames Landscape. That dissertation is a sophisticated study of the complex relationships between Morris's designs and the natural environment, a topic that she will take up again in today's talk. Um, Sarah previewed tonight's talk at the College Art Association convention last month, which I attended, and I can promise you tonight a provocative exploration of the connections among art, ecology, and global politics in the late 19th century. Sarah is an independent scholar who has held fellowships at a number of institutions, including the Huntington Library, New College. College Oxford, the Yale Center for British Art, and Dumbarton Oaks. She has served on the board of the William Morris Society in the United States since 2019. She currently holds the position of vice president of the society. She is also spearheading the redesign of our website, uh, which is set to launch later this spring. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have her as the first speaker for William Morris's birthday and for what we anticipate will be a monthly series throughout the coming year. We have a rather large audience tonight. So I'm going to be asking people as the talk goes on, if you have a question you'd like to ask Sarah afterward, uh, please put it in the chat. And rather than um, people have to raise hands uh, uh, afterward, um, given the size of the group, I will uh, be posing questions that I'll take from the chat. My other uh, request is if you could please take a moment and make sure you're muted before we begin. We all love your dog, but, uh, but uh, if we don't hear its barks during the uh, presentation, that will be all to the good. So uh, Sarah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Sarah's talk will be about uh, 20 minutes, and after that, we'll have uh, a Q&A for about uh, 20 minutes and winding up uh, by quarter of. So thank you, Sarah. Great. Thank you, Michael. And I apologize in advance if the dogs that I'm dog sitting do make themselves known in the presentation. Uh, they like to be part of everything, so, but hopefully that they're sleeping right now. So thank you everyone for being here. This is so exciting. It's so exciting to share Morris's birthday with all of you. And I will go ahead and share my screen and we can get into the presentation. And before we begin, I will say, as Michael said, this project grew partially out of my dissertation, as well as some other research that I've been doing. So this is really going to be an overview and I'm very happy to get into more detail on just about anything that comes up. Um, a wonderful member of my dissertation committee, Margaret Stetz is also here on the call and knows just how into depth I can get with some of these details. So that said, we can begin as soon as I move my own image so that I can see my presentation, which would be helpful. Here we go. I will also, Thank the William Morris Society for hosting me. And uh, I will also, I have so many little notes that I wanna make. I'll also say for accessibility purposes, if any of you would like a transcript of this presentation, images to review, any other materials, or even if you have a question that you wanna follow up about afterwards, feel free, please feel free to contact me at the email I have, I have listed here, which is smeadleonard at gmail.com. Um, and also if you are on Twitter, I encourage you to check out the Morris Society Twitter, but also um, I have some Morris related projects that I do, the primary one of which is Every Morris, where I've been tweeting about every single design ever made by Morris and Company. 
which has been a very fun project. So to begin, I will begin this paper with an anecdote. When I was early in my PhD studies, I attended a dinner with alumni from my department. When I told them of what I that I planned to study William Morris, this person's response was, oh, he's obvious. They then went on to tell me that I needed to find another subject. This person's frankly insulting comments seemed to be founded on a belief that because Morris was well known, he must also be well studied. And if I wanted to move forward in the field, I would need to choose a subject less mainstream. Given my nature, such a criticism was only ever going to make me dig in my heels. But the further I went in my work, the more I realized how wrong that person was. Despite Morris's huge popularity, critical approaches to Morris's design are very thin on the ground. And even some very basic facts, such as exactly how many wallpapers he designed in his career, are all but impossible to find. I'm going to stop very briefly and ask if everybody can make sure that they're on mute because there's something kind of strange going on with um, the video where I'm not actually seeing myself because I think someone else is um, highlighted. We're, we are seeing you, Sarah. Okay, We're then that's just on my that. end. Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that everybody was seeing the right thing. Okay, thank you. It's a little bit odd to be talking into the screen and not see yourself, but it's all good. The problems of Zoom. <laughs> so anyway, as I was saying, despite his huge popularity, critical approaches to Morris's design work are thin on the ground. And even some very basic facts, such as Stop exactly how here. many wallpapers he designed in his career are all but impossible to find. There's a wealth of information left to be learned about his work, on top of that, a potential infinity of interpretations. By asking new questions of Morris and approaching his work through modern interpretive frameworks, we can complicate canonical and simplistic views of his work and show that he is anything but obvious. Is the iPad on VPN or something? Or I canceled that VPN. In this paper, I will explore just one avenue of Morrisian study, which I have found particularly rich, the investigation of his materials. The aim of this paper is not to put forward new conclusions about Morris, but rather to show through a pair of related case studies, how deep inspection of his work can open new perspectives on his place in his own time and his legacies in ours. To date, Morris's materials have been almost oddly underexamined. The techniques of his design production are discussed extensively, but the materials involved in those techniques are treated as inert, neutral, subsidiary, contextless, as though they simply appeared in place, ready to be used, and then disappeared after they had filled their productive function. Such an approach has long been common throughout design history and art history. However, materials do not simply exist. They are the result of natural systems such as geology and ecology. They require labor such as cultivation, extraction, and processing. They are moved and traded and are often implicated in the economic and power disparities of imperialism, colonialism, and global oh, yeah. capitalism. And both their creation and their use leave behind, behind. impacts. In this paper, I will show how in-depth study of one material, indigo, illuminates underexplored aspects of Morris's relationship with the world around him, from global political systems to localized ecosystems. Indigo is an emblematic Morrisian material. It created the deep blues, which act as the backdrops for many of his most well-known printed fabrics, including Strawberry Thief, which we've been looking at, and the other patterns listed here from the 1880s. No, I've got my own. And yet, Indigo itself pops up in writings on Morris as though the blocks of dye material manifested on the workbench, ready to be dissolved into a solution and applied to the fabric. The actual story, of course, is far more complicated. In the next few minutes, I will explore that story in order to give some idea of how Morris's works interrelate with deep, complex material histories. The dye stuff we call indigo is a chemical produced by several different plants of a variety of genuses. The most common of these is indigo ferro tinctoria, 
a tropical species, which has been used in dyeing for at least 5,000 years and has been a common crop in many, and was a common crop in many parts of Asia and Africa long before the arrival of European imperial powers. In the early modern period, knowledge of the indigo dye process began to spread in Europe and the dye itself was imported into the European market in ever increasing quantities. The demand for the dye meant that European imperial powers soon wanted to grow it themselves rather than, than relying on trade for their imports. Spanish and French agriculturalists found ideal conditions for the plant in Central America and the Caribbean, and it was soon grown and processed there on a very large scale. The British had less success establishing their own indigo plantations in their American colonial holdings, and in the end of the 18th century, they began to instead look to India to supply their burgeoning textile industry. You said what? I'll she said she just opened it with the link and it was no problem, so. That's exactly what I did, so. Just to note that while I'm going to be using India and Indian in this paper to refer to areas of British colonial control in the subcontinent during the period in question, the region is of course not monolithic, and I will pr primarily be addressing indigo producing regions of Bengal, Bihar, and Uttar Pradesh along the Ganges, some of which are now located in the modern nation of India and others in modern Bangladesh. Unlike wow. the Caribbean and Central America, India already had a long history of indigo production. In fact, some scholars believe indigo tinctoria may have originated in the subcontinent. However, in the 18th century, in the Indian indigo production was a cottage industry focused on supplying local craftspeople. In order to meet demands for the material back in Britain, British planters imported the indigo production methods used in the Caribbean and Central America and wielded their capital and legal power to manipulate indigenous agricultural and labor systems to their own ends. The shift to industrialized large scale indigo production in India was successful from the British perspective. The consistency of the product was stabilized and the amount manufactured and exported did not so much increase as explode. As in the Americas, the new system of colonialist indigo production relied heavily on the exploitation of a workforce with the indigenous populations of India taking the place of enslaved populations in the Americas. The system was famously brutal. In 1859, a revolt in Bengal driven by the distress of indigo growers led to the near collapse of the regional government. After 1860, some reforms were put in place, but the system remained highly exploitative and the continued suffering in indigo producing areas eventually led to a second round of rebellion in Bihar in the early 20th century during which Mahatma Gandhi first undertook his practice of nonviolent protest in India. These periods of unrest were fueled primarily by the unjust way indigo agriculture was managed. Indian indigo farmers were often caught in cycles of debt and the economic privilege given to indigo above even rice led to frequent periods of food shortage. However, and unsurprisingly, the Indian indigo industry did not just exploit local populations in the field. The process of turning plant to dye is long, labor intensive and noxious. It requires fermentation, oxidation and settling and it was originally carried out in small containers that could be hand mixed. In the Indian industry under British imperial rule, however, the process was sc scaled up with the building of indigo factories. However, the mixing was not mechanized for the new scale. Instead, the workers stood waist deep in the fermented indigo liquid, a solution so unpleasant that Diderot's encyclopedia in the, the images we've already seen labeled the Caribbean fermentation vat the devil's tank. The work of standing in this awful indigo soup was performed by those at the bottom of the labor system, such as the migrants who, who arrived to join the wage labor pools after being displaced by colonial expansion in the period. There's a great deal to be said about the extent of British knowledge of this system in the 19th century. For the sake of brevity, however, I will note here that both the rebellions and the factory system were known in Britain. Illustrations of Indi Indian indigo agriculture and processing appeared repeatedly in the British popular press between the 1860s and the 1880s. This Indian made clay model of an indigo factory, which really merits an entire book on its own. It's an incredibly interesting object and one of sev several was displayed at the 1886 Colonial and Indi Indian Exhibition in London 
an exhibition inspired in part by Mauritian views on arts and craft, on art and craft, as some of the listeners here may know. And I'll also say for the sake of scale, this object is five or six feet wide. It's huge. And I'm happy to talk about it in the questions afterwards. I raise all of these issues because of the new context they create for Morris's work with Indigo in the same period. The models from 1885, probably May 1885. Here we have Medway also from 1885. It is extremely unlikely that Morris was unaware of the origins of his indigo, although the question of what his views on that, might, on that matter might have been is of course more complicated. There are some hints that Morris might not have agreed with British rule in India, which is unsurprising given his general anti-government stance, as well as his rather isolationist perspective. But he barely mentions India in his writings, and when he does, it is usually in passing. The most prominent mention of India in Morris's life is in a group letter to the Times, which he did not, doesn't seem to have composed, but which he and a number of other arts and crafts leaders did sign. Written in 1879, the letter calls attention to the possible ill effect British bad taste might have on Indian craft, a typically Morrisian complaint, albeit one grounded in this case in imperialist paternalism and ideals of so-called primitive craft. Even as Morris was signing the letter criticizing Britain's place in Indian craft, however, he was also increasingly using Indian materials to create his own craft. And even as his socialist awareness of exploitative labor practices and unequal political power structures grew in the 1880s, he was working with large amounts of Indian indigo at the factory at Merton Abbey. None of this necessarily undermines the view of Morris as an anti-imperialist within the metrics of his own period. But it does complicate it by revealing the inextricable material link between his well-known visual works and exploitative imperial Victorian systems of extraction, production, and labor. And it certainly does not support Edward Said's conclusion that Morris can be considered, quote, totally opposed to imperialism, end quote. If one looks only to Morris's writings, one might see him as a man apart existing solely in opposition to dominant Victorian systems. But by looking to his materials and products, we gain a more nuanced view of Morris's place within his own time. This new critical approach to Morris's relationship with the empire is not the only new perspective opened up by a close study of his indigo. In my recently completed dissertation, I looked not to the origins of Morris's materials, but their afterlife. While writing on Morris's relationship with the River Thames and its tributaries, I began to question the material implications of that relationship. Namely, since the Morrison Company factory Martin Abbey was located on a Thames tributary, the Wandle, and making use of the Wandle's water to produce its fabrics, what impacts might that have had on the surrounding landscape and ecology? To discover the answer to this question, I again needed to look to Morris's materials, and some of the most striking information I uncovered centered again on his most emblematic die. Just to give you an idea of the location and surroundings I'll be discussing in this section, Merton Abbey, the place, is located on the southwestern edge, well, what was then the southwestern edge of London there on the Wandle, uh, which is a river that flows south to north, uh, almost due south, south of where Kelmscott House is. It is no longer a site, it is under a uh, Sainsbury's. So unfortunately, it's not a place that people vi visit very often anymore, but the Wandle is st still there. It's still an interesting place to see. And actually, I got to see it partially because of the funding of the Morris Society. So again, thank you. <laughs> so fabric production at Merton Abbey began in 1882. It was there that Morris was able to produce large quantities of the deep, rich indigo blue fabric he had been seeking since he began designing textiles in the 1860s. Lined up on the floor of the factory's dye house were four vats, approximately three feet square, where the waddle of the water of the wandle was mixed with ground cakes of Indian indigo to create indigo dye. And you can see those on the image on the left here. These vats were a central site of the factory and even a visitor's attraction. Morris enjoyed showing off the magical moment when a freshly dyed length of cloth emerges from the dye vat and shifts from bright green to deep blue as the dye oxidizes. After dyeing in the vats, 
the indigo fabrics underwent the discharge process. This involved soaking them in a solution of the chemical bichrome, then using carved printing blocks to apply a paste of oxalic and sulfuric acids in a gum and clay thickener. When these acids met the bichrome cured fabric, the resulting chemical reaction would remove the indigo blue from wherever it was pr printed, leaving behind the bare cloth. And you can see that on the left in this example of Wandel that doesn't have the over dyeing on it. Wandel was printed with two different types of discharge, one that took away everything and left white and one that was a half discharge that left a light blue. And then the edges there where you see the dark blue, that would originally the whole fabric would be that color and then the dye would be taken off. After this step, the fabrics would be cleaned and then over dyed to add other colors. This process is often described in writing on Morris's designs, but again, the indigo and other materials are treated as objects that existed only when in use at the factory with no history and no afterlife. Yet, the laws of matter applied as much in Merton Abbey as anywhere else. Materials had to come from somewhere before they were used and the fabrics were not the only result of the production process. There were, was also waste material and it had to go somewhere. And at Merton Abbey, a great deal of it seems to have gone into the river. This is hardly a great secret. The factory's washing wheel, which rinsed fabrics directly in the river, as you can see in this image on the left, is shown often in writing on Morris's works. However, the implications of that washing are not considered nor are the implications of the large vats of dyes and carboys of chemicals that sat in the dye house. These were so-called natural dyes derived from plants, but natural is not a synonym for safe. And the dyeing process also required the use of a variety of human made chemicals from a range of acid and bases to heavy metal based mordants to bichrome, the essential soaking material of indigo discharge. The effects of some of these materials on ecosystems were not well known in the 19th century. For example, they had yet to discover the effects heavy metal pollution has on ocean life, but others such as bichrome were already well known to be poisons and pollutants in the period. When Morris's fabrics were washed in the Wandel, a whole variety of dye chemicals would have entered the stream. Additionally, the dye process would have created waste products. In the case of the indigo, the dye and potential of the vats would eventually have been spent at that point, they would have been cleaned and drained, a process that included the scrubbing away of a dense paste of spent dye product that precipitates at the bottom of the vat. During my research, I calculated that the vats would have contained approximately 200 gallons of dye liquid each, uh, information that Morris's own notes actually supports. And that all had to go somewhere. And I have no reason to think that it drained anywhere but into the wandel. Given the relatively small scale of the Merton Abbey works and the slow rate of their hand wrought production, the factory would never have been a major polluter in comparison with large scale automated, automated textile works like those that Morris railed against in the North. However, this does not mean that the impact of Morris's materials at Merton Abbey can be discounted. Ecosystems are just that, systems, and every element affects many others. Additionally, pollution is not a single act, but a cumulative process. Upon entering the stream, Merton Abbey's contributions of dyes, acid, mordants, soaps, and curing solutions would have joined myriad others. The Wandel's nine mile length was host to approximately 40 industrial premises in the late 19th century. And several miles downstream from Merton at Wandsworth, the pollutants of those factories joined the Thames, mingling with the industrial, agricultural, and urban runoffs of much of Southern England and becoming part of the turbid soup at London's heart. The effects of Merton Abbey may have been negligible within the vast effluvia of the period, but they were present nonetheless. Just as the origins of indigo complicate the view of Morris as the pure anti-imperialist, the afterlife of the dye complicates the view of him as a pure proto-ecologist, an idol of nascent green thought. Again, this is not to say that his writings and beliefs did not align with those views, especially in comparison to others in his period, but rather that study of his materials and his designs can give us a more nuanced view of a complicated figure living in a complicated time, enmeshed in systems of trade, exploitation, industry, and environmental degradation, even as he railed against them. In both of the case studies I've laid out here, my investigation of Morris's materials started from factual questions. 
Where did Morris's indigo come from? Where did its waste products go? The research I, research I carried out to answer these questions added to my empirical knowledge. I discovered information I had never seen in published works, and I drew out new histories of Morris's designs. But in the same research and the methods behind it also led me to new interpretations of Morris's work and new understandings of his place within his period and within systems that dominated his world and heavily influenced our own. And of course, this is only one example of how current critical and interpretive, approach, interpretive approaches can show us new things about William Morris today. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, Sarah, so much. Um, so I wanted to say to everybody, um, if you want to type questions into the chat, uh, everyone is muted at the moment, but I would be delighted to uh, uh, take your questions and uh, pass them on to Sarah. And while we're, uh, uh, while we're waiting for those questions to appear, in the chat, um, I'll just mention, um, it's really um, exciting, Sarah, the sort of work you're doing. Um, many of you may be familiar with the work of David Saxby, who's an um, historian in uh, London and who has uncovered the history of the workers at uh, Merton Abbey in um, publications that he's doing in the magazine of the William Morris Society of the UK. Uh, Sarah, it's exciting. Uh, David, uh, David's very local history and your global history, I think, are wonderfully complementary. So we're, we're lucky to have this uh, amazing uh, recent work on Martin Abbey. Um, so a number of questions are coming. And um, Sarah, here's a, a starting one. Um, that large scale indigo model that you mentioned. Um, uh, people, like, we've got a couple of questions about that. Yeah, can you unmute yourself? No, I can, however. Um, just a moment. I can... Uh, yeah, the, the dog started barking, so I muted myself and it oh, okay. that was a now. Great. <laughs> uh, what in particular about the model would people like to hear about? I'm looking at the uh, questions. Um, yeah, the, uh, wanted to hear more about the, about yeah. the factory model and yeah. Yeah, um, it's a really, really interesting object. It was made by an Indian, Indian craftsperson. We actually know the person's name, which is fairly exceptional for um, a lot of objects like that at the time, let alone a colonial object. Um, and it was a fairly major piece of the Indian and colonial exhibition in 1886. It was written up in newspapers. It apparently was very popular with viewers. Um, it's made in a tradition of clay model making that comes out of that area, comes out of Bengal and Bihar. Um, I haven't, I'm trying to remember, it's been several years since I've read the scholarship on it. Um, I can't remember exactly why they were made, but there is a version that's still in Calcutta. I think there's at least three versions of these objects. Uh, there's been some really great writing on them done by people at Kew, which is where the, the one that I showed lives and I actually got to see it in person. I was very lucky actually to sit beside someone from Q uh, at a conference and mentioned that I was working on Morris and Indigo. And she said, oh, well, we have this object in our offices. Do you want to come see it? Uh, that was my friend, now quite a good friend, Kim, who showed me that object and it was really wonderful. Um, and it is part of the economic botany collection at Q, which is an incredibly interesting uh, collection that came out of the empire um, as plant explorers engaged with objects and with materials and with the material potential of plants. Um, and I, I hope somebody at some point writes a whole book on the history of those objects because they're incredibly interesting. So. Um, 
Sarah, question from uh, Brandy and Mulby. Um, could you speak more to the availability of indigo from sources outside in India? Would there have been any more ethically sourced uh, indigo available? And uh, Sarah mentions uh, Bern Jones's uh, rejection of Mummy Brown uh, mm -hmm. once he learned about the sourcing. Um, not that I know of. Because the thing about indi indigo is that indigo is a tropical product. Um, the interesting thing about the blue is that like there is a native indigo to Europe, which is woad. It is actually the same chemical. It's not an, it's not an indigo ferra plant, but it produces the exact same chemical with the exact same effects, except for that it's not as strong. It was very good for dyeing wool. It was not good for dyeing cotton. So actually the shift to using indigo was very closely tied up in the shift to cotton. So it, you know, everything gets, the more you look at materials, the more everything gets intertwined, but they're really, you know, if Morris wanted to use indigo, which apparently he did, he actually rejected the traditional European medieval material in favor of a material that created better blue. He kind of had to look to colonial sources. Um, and there was a huge amount of indigo, Indian indigo that was just filtering into London and I'm, I don't think there were other sources really because it was in such plentiful supply from India. Um, Sarah, um, Amy uh, Torbert mentions that I'd like to hear a, a bit more about some of Morris's other materials and dyes or some uh, more prevalent uh, and more environmentally destructive than others. To what extent, uh, you know, is, is indigo an outlier or typical? It's, Every material is a little bit different and they all kind of have different peaks and valleys. So like matter, matter is a European uh, dye. It's the red dye. Uh, I think a lot of the matter was still coming out of the Netherlands in the 19th century, but matter is very environmentally destructive because it's one of the uh, dyes that's printed using these mordants that use arsenic and cyanide, you know, these very, poisonous heavy metals. Um, so even though like the material itself is less fraught than the after effects of it almost are more fraught. Um, there's also Cursitron, which is one of the yellow dyes which came out of America actually. It's a wood dye that came out, came out of America. Uh, someone else from the University of Delaware, Heather Hansen wrote an excellent MA thesis on that. It's probably a little bit less exploitative because it's just tree bark. <laughs> um, I would love to dive into all of these materials. You know, indigo was kind of the obvious one because I knew that it was an imperial material. So it was the first one that I latched onto. At some point I or someone also needs to look into the cotton because I think the cotton, you get a lot of interest in the cotton up until the 1860s in scholarship on British materials because people are engaging with the relationship with America and with the relationship with uh, enslaved labor. His, Morris's cotton is probably also coming from India or else possibly from Egypt, but most likely from India. And that's something that I haven't managed to track down yet, but that's another one that is also doubly interesting because it was probably being produced in India, but then most likely it was woven in Manchester or one of the other Northern cities because he's using standard, he's not weaving his own cotton, he's using standard widths of cotton, 36 inches, which is still the width of cotton that you get today, you know, coming out of looms, presumably somewhere in the North of England. And I've yet to track down what the story on that is, but that's another one that is incredibly interesting to look into. Sarah, uh, a question about um, how, uh, your research has, uh, what impacts it has had on your own uh, reading of uh, Morris's designs? Hmm. <laughs> That's a big question. When you spend essentially eight years staring at the designs, you do see them in new lights. Um, I have enjoyed the extra nuance it's given me, you know, these kind of questions uh, that I was talking about in this talk, understanding them as complicated objects, not just as 
beautiful objects, which obviously they are, and I've always really appreciated them aesthetically, but understanding how they interact with the rest of Victorian society, with the world has been really, really interesting, but also, you know, to go on a completely different tack, when I was working on my dissertation and working on this question of the rivers, I started to see the patterns in a new light also in terms of their relationship with the landscape and with ecology and in terms of these very, you know, people have talked about before, like there's the meander and the patterns, there's plants and the patterns that Morris loved, but the more you look at them and the more time you actually spend at the landscapes that he loved, especially Kelmscott, you start to see deeper and deeper and deeper relationships, um, which hopefully someday my dissertation will be published and I'll be able to share more of that with you, but it really is an abstracted version of those landscapes seen on the pa patterns. And I love that as well. So I encourage everyone to spend eight years just staring at the patterns. You discover all kinds of interesting things. Um, and, but we'll look at them differently now, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have uh, final, finally uh, two more questions and, and uh, uh, that will be it. The first one is uh, uh, brief specific. Um, do we know where Morris bought his indigo? Was it from London brokers? Did he get it from Thomas Wardle? He had a dry salter that he used in London, uh, which is a dye seller. That's what a dry salter is. Um, I cannot off the top of my head remember what their names were, but that is probably who he bought his indigo through and they then would have bought it through the indigo brokers. And that's another, you know, it's something that had to be left out in this. If this ever turns into a larger project, it will be great because there is really interesting writing on, there were whole indigo warehouses and indigo auction houses. There is this system in the city of London for selling that commodity, just like there was for any other imperial commodity. And there's a wonderful description by Charles Dickens's son of these blue rooms where the indigo is being inspected and sold and then sold on to wholesalers like the dry salter that Morris would have bought them from. I did spend an unfortunately uh, unproductive two days looking through all the ledgers of that dry salter, hoping to find any record of their sales with Morris and of the records that are publicly available that I've been able to find. I have not actually found those transaction records, but you know, if anyone has ever <laughs> <laughs> find some ledgers uh, with Morris and co dives listed in them, that would be incredibly helpful. Let me know. Great. Thanks. And, and the last, uh, the last question um, that um, in News from nowhere. Um, Morris uh, condemns um, African colonialism. Um, do you think he has a different relation to Indian uh, colonialism? After all, um, he knew Rudyard Kipling was a you know family connection of Burne Jones. Um, yeah, it's that's really the point that I haven't yet been able to suss out because it's not just that, you know, there was this connection with Kipling. It's not Morris, two of Morris's, at least one, and I think two of Morris's brothers actually served in India. You know, his brothers were military men. So it's, it's really odd that there's almost no more mention of India. What, some of the only times it comes up in his letters are, are him like saying, oh, you know, whichever brother, I think it was Arthur is off to India. And then there's no further mention. So there's this kind of lacuna there that people he knew were in India, he was working with Indian materials. And we know, you know that he was very involved in the, the Eastern problem as it was called and that he didn't like British involvement in foreign places. But then there's just, other than this paternalistic oh, we're ruining Indian craft by with our horrible British thought, which I mean, is also true, like Indian craftspeople were highly disadvantaged by the British influx of goods. You know, other than that moment, you don't get a sense of it. And it's something that I'm having that I continue to grapple with. And that I haven't really been able to answer how his views on India might be different than his views on other places that the British were involved with. So. Well. Well, Sarah, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, it shows us the, the complexity of the uh, networks in which 
Morris was involved in, there's uh, not going to necessarily be any easy answers uh, mm -hmm. here. Um, Sarah, thank you so much. I want to mention to everyone uh, before we go that this is the first of a series. Um, next month on April 28th, at uh, that's Wednesday, at again at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, uh, Monica Bowen will be speaking on William Morris and the contemporary Black American artist Kehinda Wiley, whom you probably know as the artist who painted President Obama's official portrait. Um, if you're not a member of the William Morris Society, I hope you'll consider joining us for only about $4 a month, uh, less, as they say, less than the cost of a cup of Starbucks coffee, uh, and less than that if you're a student. Um, you'll have access to uh, three publications, the Journal of the William Morris Society, uh, Useful and Beautiful, our own uh, magazine, and the magazine of the William Morris Society of the United Kingdom. Uh, plus, you'll stay informed about events uh, not only in the US, but in Canada and uh, Great Britain um, events, and uh, uh, generally be connected to the wider network of um, those interested in and admiring of William Morris. Um, plus, which uh, your membership dollars help support uh, research such as the extraordinary research that uh, Sarah was able to do in London, and that's behind this talk. So thank you very much, everyone. We'll hope to see you again on uh, April 28th. And again, Sarah, thank you for work that really provocatively pushes our understanding of William Morris in the 19th century. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Good night. <laughs>